Hi guys and welcome to a new series, Coach's Corner. And today I'm very pleased to have with me a former Bok and Bulls coach, Hanukkah Mayer. Hanukkah, thanks so much for being with us. How are you keeping? No, it's been great and it's an honor speaking to you. Thank you very much. Hanukkah, just to, to start off with, uh, just uh, tell us where, where you are right now, um, what life is like um, and, and what, are you, what are you up to on a, on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, I'm back from France. I had a great time in France. It was a great experience. And then back just before lockdown, back to South Africa. So unfortunately, a lot of rugby going on at the moment, just starting again. But I've spent some quality time with my family and my kids. I haven't seen them that much the last few years. So it's always, always believe there's a positive in the negative. So uh, but I think they had enough of me now. So it's time to move on. <laughs> but uh, it was great family time. And uh, like I said, you know, I wanted to write the book to make a difference, especially in this time. And just give maybe someone hope out there, and, and I hope I can achieve that. Sure, I mean Heineke, I mean that's, uh, I mean I, I've got your book here, and it's it's one of the things I wanted to to kind of get stuck into, and and uh, perhaps just a starting point is is to just uh, you know share with us the the idea behind the book, the process you went through in terms of putting it out, uh, and and just you know what what kind of messages were you hoping to to get out there? Yeah, you know, first of all, I said I never wanted to write the autobiography because, um, you know, you have to you have to step on toes, be negative and be controversial to, to sell books. You know, a guy that, you know, I always wanted to coach to make a difference. And I always tell the story when I read about uh, Sonny Liston fighting uh, Muhammad Ali. We know he gave him a chance. And, um, you know, Liston, they put wintergreen on their, on their gloves and hit Ali in the eyes and he wanted to quit in the fifth round. And his coach said, listen, go out there and fight one more round. And uh, in the sixth round, against all the odds, uh, Muhammad Ali had a great round. And then in the seventh round, uh, Sonny Liston threw in the towel. Nobody could believe it because he was the overwhelming favorite and uh, he, was, he was unbeatable. And I just thought at this time, you know, I really want to make a difference and uh, tell the people out there, we, everybody is, is struggling, um, you know, believe it or not. But I think everybody, some sort of is struggling. And I really want to make a difference. I just want to get one more round because we South Africans, we're proud. And uh, we've come through much worse. And this is actually not, you know, I know it's a lot of negativity, but if you look at the history, this is actually one of the better times to live. If you look at the living expectations over the last hundred years, this is, you know, there wasn't antibiotics. Um, the, the life expectancy was probably 27, 26. And if you look at the, the, the fe- yellow fever and everything, you know, all the negativity in the, in, in the olden days, and there was two wars in the last hundred years. So actually, it's not that bad. I know, and, and I say it with a lot of sentiment because I know a lot of people has been sick and a lot of people has lost uh, members and family members and loved ones. So I'm not saying in that regard, but I always wanted to be positive and make a difference. And I thought maybe, you know, I can inspire people out there. Well, sure. And, and Hanukkah, just, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the first uh, chapters, you, you speak about the, the value and importance of, of having a vision. And, and I mean, obviously, one of the, the first occasions, I, I, you know, as a coach, I'm sure that it really came into being that having a vision was with your recruitment and, and creating a, a new team and, and culture at the Bulls. Um, could you maybe just touch on, on that element of, of your coaching style as you grew into your coaching role? And, and obviously, you've become well known for your recruitment and being able to identify talent. Uh, maybe just touch on that and, and how having a vision, uh, you know, dovetails with that. Yeah, I think vision is very, very, very important. Uh, the bigger the vision, the more energy. It's not just a rugby, it's any, any endeavor in life. Um, even guy, a new vision or a dream, you know, and the bigger the vision, the more energy. I usually say it's like a magnifying glass. You know, if you take a magnifying glass and there's no focus, there's no energy. But if you focus on one specific area, you know where you're going, that vision is strong enough or that energy is strong enough from a magnifying glass to start a felt fire that can destroy countries. So the vision was always to be one of the best teams in the world or the best team with the Bulls. And I think I always say to guys, you know, if you look at an old school photo, the first person you look at is yourself when it comes back. So you have to align the vision of the team with the individual. And I was fortunate enough to get a lot of young players at the Bulls. We didn't have a budget. We wanted to be the best team in the world and to sell them their vision. But a lot of those guys also knew, I promised them if the Bulls do well, you know, they will be, they will be superstars. And I was fortunate enough to coach the likes of, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like mentioning names, but if I have to guys like Fury and, and Victor and I can go on, Brian and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Mornay, Derek, and, you know, it's actually bad to leave somebody out, but they all become superstars. And uh, that was part of the vision since they were youngsters. So, uh, and also the next generation with, with Paul Art and those guys and Jesse, and uh, so it's always very, very important to align the vision of the leader and, and, and with that of the individual and the company. 
Yeah, and I thought one of the, yeah. the, the interesting elements to it was uh, obviously you mentioned the uh, names of, of guys that uh, you were able to bring in, some that you weren't able to, like Peter Steph Dutoy, but I thought it a fascinating sort of anecdote that you added when you were talking about Derek Hochard was the fact you actually looked at Dan Carter when he was a youngster and actually uh, had an ambition to, to perhaps find a way to convince him, which uh, I'd, I'd never heard of before. I mean, was that something you thought was a realistic possibility? It's something that you mentioned, obviously, many years later, you would look back and go, gee, you should imagine if that had happened, maybe you wouldn't have been kicking yeah, that, that quite, winning goal in the World Cup. Yeah, it's quite tongue in the cheek, but I reminded him a few times. Um, because at that stage, remember, nobody wanted to come to the Bulls. We didn't have a budget. We didn't have a sponsor. And I was looking for a 10 because we didn't have 10s. Not that many in South Africa at that stage, but there wasn't any 10s in the country that I could recruit. And um, so I watched the tournament and I was very, very impressed with this youngster. And then I sent Ian Strauss, uh, Ian Swartz to go and speak to him. And I knew it would be tough, but I thought, you know, he's a youngster. Maybe I, prom I would promise him he will probably start. And I could see he was a superstar from day one. But I had so much respect for him, you know, he came back because that, at that time, if you do remember, uh, Mertens played 10 for, for the Crusaders and for the All Blacks. So I thought Mertens is going to play at least another four or five years. And maybe Card will be 22, 23, and then maybe he can go back later. But again, you know, vision, it just shows you at that age, he says, no, no way. You know, he wants to play for the Crusaders. He wants to play for the All Blacks. And he knew what was his. I reminded him once or twice when I saw him later in South Africa against New Zealand. I said, remember, we talked to you and... It's a pity you didn't come. So uh, you can't win them all. But yeah, I, I, I don't want to be um, arrogant, but I always had a very good uh, eye for young talent. And, uh, you know, a lot of the youngsters, and I knew these guys going to win the World Cup because a lot of them play when they were this, this last World Cup because a lot of them, Peter Steph and and and, and uh, um, it's a bit. And Paul Hart, a lot of those guys, you know, uh, Jesse, um, I saw them playing at 16. I know they were superstars. So uh, I couldn't win them, all of them, but uh, it was great. And I've got so much respect for Carter. You know, we always had a good relationship and it was, it's just an unbelievable, uh, um, you know, journey. And I enjoyed it to, to always do battle with the All Blacks. It's one of the things I always remember. For sure. And I, I think it's the next chapter where um, you, 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 you kind of build on it and, and speak about building um, and believing uh, in the vision that you have. Um, just, just talking about as that, that Bulls journey went along and obviously uh, reached that, that point of the 2007 Super Rugby campaign culminating in the incredible final that everyone remembers, how did you uh, kind of have that or, or get the, the squad to believe in that, that, that vision and even kind of going to, to a final in Durban against that great Sharks team and, and, and ensure they were able to believe in the ability to get a victory and you write that, you know, you said to them, I think even at half time, we might only win this in the, in the last minute, the last seconds, but I really you know, you really believe that they'd be able to do it? Yeah, I know. I was very fortunate. Um, I was on a on function with Victor and Farid the other day, and they asked me the same question. I said, you know, I was very fortunate. This, you know, I recruited them at 18, 19, and probably Victor was probably the oldest at, at 21, 22. So I grew up with those guys, and it was easy then, you know, selling them the vision, and they knew exactly what I ex what, what expected from me and, and, and what I expected from them. And, you know, in that... I say you have to believe in your vision, you know, to beat the Reds of Eddie Jones by, by, we had to beat them by 72 points to go through to home semi. I mean, that's, that's impossible. That's why I believe everything is possible. But I was fortunate enough that because I've worked with those, most of those youngsters since they were 18, 19, when they're young, they, they usually listen, they don't talk back. And as they grew, we, we, we trusted each other so much, you know, everything is leadership is about trust. And they trusted in me and it, it gets simpler and easier when you have to sell the vision and they start to believe you. And uh, what was strange in that, in that year, and I didn't go into much depth in the book, we wanted a short, punchy book, but I said to them that they must, they must train twice on Christmas and twice on New Year because our team is not going to train, and that's going to be the difference between winning and losing. It's the next chapter, actually work ethic as well. And uh, then we scored that, that, um, you know, that, that try in the last minutes. And again, people say it's luck, but we had numerous, numerous exercises. Where I would say I called it in Afrikaans, keep the ball, only ball. And they had to keep the ball for five minutes. If they make a mistake, they must go back to the poles and start all over again. So that wasn't by chance. You know, we've trained that. And, and that's the difference between coaching the international side and the, and the club side. You've got the time of a club side, with the international side not. But I think that was a group of people that had the same vision to want to be the best in the world. We worked very well together, had very good leadership. And whatever I said, they believe in it. And once they bought in, everybody's, you know, everybody bought in and, and work in the same direction. Then it's like a company or anyone, you know, if people believe in something and they work for each other, and I don't care who gets the ego, you'll be successful. So that's a believable year. We didn't go into the depth. I mean, I, I said there, which is 
if I think back now, as you get older, you, you start to uh, disbelieve. You know, it's, it's, it's so strange. But I remember when we played the Lions in that, in that year, um, we beat them in the 2002 Carry Cup final. I think it was 32-7. And I asked them exactly for that score because we had to, those days, Super Rugby was so tough, it was points difference that, that, that decide the, the second spot and the sixth spot. So we had to call up. And I, I, I remember clearly that before we went in, I said, listen, give me that same score and we'll take it. The whole week, I said, just give me that score. That's, that's good enough. And if you look at that score, that was exactly the same score. The 2002 and the 2007. I mean, what's the chances? It's like, it's like winning the lotto. It's actually worse. <laughs> it's worse than winning the lotto. So it just shows you, you know, that team really believes. And that's why I'm, you know, I try to be positive in this times. So I, I must admit, I don't always get it right. I'm just a human being as well. But we have to be positive in this country, and, and, and especially our rugby gives us hope. And there's so many good things in this country. For sure. And Heineken, just just touching on, I mean, that's that campaign was probably a great example of, of life as a coach with the, the, the highs and lows, uh, the pain and the pleasure. When, when you look back uh, on all your experiences as, as a coach at, at different levels, different teams, uh, you know, how challenging is it to cope with those, you know, differing levels of, of emotion? And, and, you know, obviously sometimes the, the things you've got planned work out perfectly and, and other times uh, it completely goes the other direction and you have to deal with disappointment and defeat. Yeah, you know, I always say that back to the pace of the leader, they look at you and as you get older, it gets more, it gets more um, extreme and more difficult because when you're a youngster, you believe you can change the world. And uh, what's difficult if you lose a game, you know, you're the guy that have to pull yourself up and be positive on the Monday. And I remember that that specific year, you know, we trained like never before. And uh, in the first three games, we lost two out of three. And I told him the seven up story where I didn't write it in the book because he wanted the book to be short. But we one up and the guy didn't make it. He went bankrupt. He brought out a cool drink and two up and three up. And at six up, he stopped. And somebody else started seven up and, and it's a worldwide success. So it was difficult then, but I, we worked so hard and we believe in each other that uh, I knew we would come back because we just worked hard. You know, like I said, we worked just started early and we all buy into the vision. And I think, you know, as a coach, I sometimes feel for coaches. I'm not a coach at this moment, but you know, in that World Cup in 2015, we played against the best All Black team ever, and we had responsibility there. But you know, we lost two. We lost against them with two points, and against Japan with two points. So the difference was two points. Otherwise, I would probably be a hero as well today in South Africa. But the difference is, is, is a, and there's so many things you can go and look in the game. You know, forward passes, knock-ons, little things that can go either way. But sometimes it just doesn't go your way. And I'm still proud of the way we came back. So and that's what's tough. You know, I look at Ian Foster. Um, you know. Three weeks back, he was the he was unbelievable. The biggest score against Australia ever in 100 years of history, and he was a superstar hero. And then he lost against Argentina and Australia, and, and they crucified him. And then they came back with an unbelievable performance against the, the Pumas. And that's coaching, you know, it keeps you humble, keeps you fighting. And that's what I believe in the book. You know, it's easy to write the book and just say how great you are and all your wins. And people forget because I hammer on the negatives. We also had great times and great victories and two, un two unbeaten end of year tours, which I don't write about. But I think as a coach, and that's what I want to put out there, you have to fight. You know, a guy like Eddie, you know, we, we beat the team, beat them 70, uh, 92 3. And he lost eight games in a row, I think, when he was Australian coach. And Jake lost 49 0 and then went on to win the World Cup. Rossi lost at one stage. He wanted to stop. So. You know, even a guy like Steve Hansen, I spoke to him and I wrote it in the book where he told me he was he was one of the most hated guys in, um, you know, in uh, in in, in um, Wales, and they've asked him, you know, what must you do to um, what must you do uh, to, to be number one? And he said, they said to him, just keep on coaching because <laughs> you're on the right track. So even, you know, he's such a humble guy. He told me um, he's the coach that won the most Test matches ever. But also the coach that lost the most test matches ever, um, because a lot of them was with Wales. So it just shows you that that's what I like about coaching. It's 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 very mental, and you have to keep on fighting. You get scrutinized by the public and media, but um, if you really love people and love what you do, uh, you'll be successful. And that's that's what I want to put out there to people.